All right, in this example, we're going to use a little bit of calculus to sketch the function the square root of 9 minus x squared. Um, so again, potentially this may be a function that you recognize, and at the tail end, maybe I'll point out how to recognize it. But for now, let's just again use a little bit of calculus. So um, the first thing, again, I'm going to think about is the domain. So just like the previous example, um, since we have a square root, Again, whatever is underneath the square root, that has to be greater than or equal to zero. Well, um, you've got to be a little careful here. So recall, you know, how do we um, how do we solve a quadratic inequality? Well, the first thing I do is we solve the corresponding equation. So nine minus x squared equals zero. Well, we could factor that as three minus x and three plus x. This is a difference of perfect squares. If we set each factor equal to zero, we'll get x equals three from our first uh, our first factor, and then x equals negative three from our second factor. And what I do is I make a little number line, and I put those numbers on there, so negative three and positive three. And now I go back and start thinking about the actual inequality. Okay, so I test these values first. So for example, if we plugged in positive three for our x. We would get nine minus nine, or excuse me, nine minus uh, three squared, which would be nine minus nine. So we would get zero, and well, zero is greater than or equal to zero, so that points in the domain. If we take something, uh, let's see, if we take negative three, the same reason. If we square it, we'll get nine. We'll have nine minus nine, and we'll get zero. And again, hey, zero is greater than or equal to zero. If we take a number in between, say x equals zero, and plug it into our inequality. Well, we would get 9 minus 0, and that is greater than or equal to 0. So um, all the points between negative 3 and positive 3 are in the domain. But notice if we take anything larger than 3, say 10, well, then we would get 9 minus 100. 9 minus 100 is not greater than or equal to 0. So nothing bigger than 3 uh, would work. Likewise, uh, nothing smaller than negative 3 would work. So now we've got the domain of our function. So again, uh, I think, do we call it f of x? Doesn't really matter, but just to stay consistent, yes. So we had f of x equals the square root of 9 minus x squared. So the domain of this function would just be from negative 3 uh, up to positive 3 inclusive. So now I'm just going to think about sort of uh, just, just sketching it. Uh, and to sketch it, I'm going to start thinking about intervals of increase and decrease. And maybe we can figure out if there's any local maximums or minimums. So the first thing I'm going to do is rewrite this as 9 minus x squared all raised to the 1 half power. Well, if we take the, the uh, derivative of that, the 1 half would come out front we would have 9 minus x squared left over inside. If we take 1 away, that will give us negative 1 half. But then we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which would be negative 2x. So if we simplify this, that would give us, let's see, so 1 half times 2 would be 1. We would be left over with the negative x. We could stick the 9 minus x squared uh, to the negative 1 half in the denominator and make it 9 minus x squared to the positive 1 half. And again, that's just the same thing as negative x over the square root of 9 minus x squared. All right, so um, again, we've got to find critical points, and that means we need to take uh, the numerator and set that equal to 0, and we need to take the denominator and set it equal to 0. And again, by doing this, we're figuring out where the derivative equals 0 and where the derivative is undefined. Well, the first equation is pretty easy. You can just multiply both sides by negative 1. That'll give us x equals 0. Um, for the second equation, we can square both sides and get 9 minus x squared equals 0. But we already solved that a second ago when we were finding you know, the, the domain part. You can add x squared, take the square root. We would get x equals positive and negative uh, 3. OK, so again, at positive and negative 3, notice these are points in the domain. We had found that. But again, it's going to be undefined. So I think these are going to be the places where we get our vertical asymptotes in this case. Um, so let's see. If we, uh, if we think about intervals of increase and decrease, and I'm just going from negative 3 to positive 3. Normally when I make my number line, I'm thinking negative infinity to positive infinity. 
But in this case, again, our domain is negative 3 to positive 3. So I'm going to go back and, uh, you know, I, I, let's take a number, say, between 0 and 3. Notice if we use, for example, positive 1. The square root, by definition, in the denominator always gives you a positive value. So if we plug 1 in, notice the numerator is certainly going to be negative. So we would have a negative over a positive, which would be a negative. So that tells us the function is decreasing. If we plug in a negative number, say negative 1, well, now the numerator would be positive. Um, and again, the denominator is positive no matter what. So we've got that our function is increasing up till 0 and then uh, decreasing between 0 and 3. So we actually know at x equals 0, there's going to be a local maximum. Alrighty, well, let's see here. Um, we can also look at the second derivative just to help us think about concavity. And again, I'm going to go back to sort of, you know, we had it simplified to this. I'm going to go back to uh, our, our kind of our first version. So um, maybe let's actually rewrite f prime real quick. So f prime of x, again, uh, the 1 half and the 2 are 1. It looks like we would have negative x. And then we would have 9 minus x squared to the negative 1 half. So the second derivative is going to be a little bit more involved just because we've got to now use the product rule as well as the chain rule. So let's see, the derivative of negative x, that's just negative 1. We can leave the 9 minus x squared to the negative 1 half alone. Then we'll stick our plus in between. Um, we can leave the negative x alone. And now we'll have to use the chain rule when we take the derivative of 9 minus x squared to the negative 1 half. So the negative 1 half comes out front, leave the stuff on the inside alone, take 1 away from our exponent, so that'll give us negative 3 over 2. And the derivative of the inside, again, will be negative 2x. All right, so I'm going to try to, uh, again, clean this up a little bit. So we've got negative 9 minus x squared to the negative 1 half. Let's see, it looks like we have a negative times a negative, that'll make a positive, times another negative. So it looks like the signs will be negative. We've got a, let's see, a half times a 2, so that'll just give us 1. Uh, we've got an x and an x, so that'll give us x squared. And then we've got this 9 minus x squared to the negative 3 halves left over. So again, what I like to try to do on these is um, I always factor out the negative exponents. Um, and again, I'm going to factor out the smaller one. So in this case, we could factor out the 9 minus x squared to the negative 3 over 2. Inside the brackets, well, let's see, we would need a negative 1 to get you know, our negative sign back. We would also need 9 minus x squared to some power. And again, with like bases, we add the exponents. So negative 3 halves plus what is negative 1 half? Well, I think negative 3 half plus 1 is going to give us a, a negative 1 half. Let's see, so we pulled out the correct 9 minus x squared to the negative 3 halves, so we would just need our negative x squared. All right, I think we can uh, simplify a little bit more. Okay, so inside the brackets, um, well, I'm going to do two things at once. The 9 minus x squared to the negative 3 over 2, I'm going to stick that in the denominator as positive 3 over 2. I almost wrote negative 3 over 2 again. Um, we would have a negative 9 when we distribute. But then notice we would get a positive x squared when we distribute, and then our minus x squared would just cancel out. So I think this is actually our second derivative. We would get negative 9. We would just be left with negative 9 over 9 minus x squared to the positive 3 over 2 power. So we would do the same thing. Um, we would try to think, what makes the second derivative 0? Well, nothing. What makes the second derivative undefined? Well, again, we would take the denominator, set it equal to 0. To get rid of this exponent, again, you could just uh, raise both sides to the 2 thirds power. So on the left side, we would just be left with 9 minus x squared. On the right, we would just be left with 0. Same thing before, you can add your x squared. Take the square root, we'll get positive and negative 3. So, all right. So I'm going to stick those numbers, and again, those are the endpoints of my, uh, you know, the domain, basically. So if we take any number between negative 3 and 3, again, maybe I'm, I'm going to use 0, just because that's easy to do the arithmetic with. Uh, 
Um, again, the denominator is going to be positive, because we would have 9 cubed, which is positive. Then to the 1 half power, you'd be square rooting it. But the top is definitely negative. So that tells us our function is always concave down. So let's see here. I think we're in a decent position to start sketching now, because we said from negative 3 up to 0, you know, it's increasing. From 0 to 3, it's decreasing. Um, we said it's concave down everywhere. So maybe a rough sketch for something like this. So again, we're trying to sketch 9 minus x squared. Well, if you plug positive 3 in, we'll get 9 minus 9. We'll get the square root of 0, which is 0. Um, if you plug negative 3 in, we'll get 9 minus 9. We'll get 0. And then it says the function is just increasing and then uh, up till 0. And then it starts decreasing. And again, it's kind of concave down the whole time. So that would be a rough sketch of our, of our picture here. Notice if we plug in x equals 0, sort of the place that should be the local maximum. If we plug in 0, we'll just get the square root of 9, which is 3. So there's 0, 3, and that would be the sketch of our graph. So just using a little bit of calculus. The way that you might also recognize this function, I don't know, um, you could rewrite f of x as y. If you square both sides, notice you would get 9 minus x squared equals y squared. And then we could add the x squared over. We would have x squared plus y squared. Recall that when you have a, a function of this form, this is actually a circle that's centered at the origin with radius 3. So normally x squared plus y squared equals 9, you would get the whole entire circle. But if you kind of go backwards, um, you know, so if you went backwards, you could subtract the x squared. And technically here we're taking a square root. So normally we would get a positive and a negative if we took the square root. But all we're doing is we're not doing the negative part. We're doing the positive square root, which is what gives us the top part of our circle. If the, you know, if the, if the problem had been to graph, say, negative square root of 9 minus x squared, if we had graphed that one instead, that would have given us, say, the bottom part of the circle instead. So, but it wasn't. It was uh, just positive square root of 9 minus x squared. So I think this is a good little, uh, you know, A, I think it's certainly important to remember equations of circles. Um, and this is just a good little graph to remember. It seems like you run into it often enough. And people often forget, you know, it looks kind of strange at first, but a lot of people, when you sort of show them the little trick with the circle, that's something a little bit more familiar from algebra, and then they kind of remember the graph.